Hi everybody, my name's Rachel and I work for the charity Dig Deep um, and Sam and I are here today to tell you everything that you need to know about our amazing East African challenges. So both Sam and I have climbed Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya, so we've got loads of personal experience, so I hope you enjoy listening to our presentations. Hello, my name's Sam and I'm going to be telling you all about Dig Deep's Mount Kilimanjaro challenge for the summer of 2019 that you could be getting involved with at your university. First of all, I'll introduce you to the challenges team at Dig Deep, which is made up of Rachel, Simon and Nina, uh, and all three of them, as well as myself, have taken part in at least two international challenges. So we know exactly what it's like to be doing something like this whilst you're at university. Uh, and we'll be here to support you throughout the year whilst you prepare for your climb. So who are we? We're Dig Deep. We were founded in 2007 by student volunteers. Um, so we've always been working with the student community and we basically aim to increase access to clean water and sanitation for communities in rural areas of Kenya. So this is predominantly where we work uh, in a region called Bomit County in southwest Kenya, which is quite close to Mount Kilimanjaro. That's why we choose it as a challenge. So we're a very focused organisation. We aren't trying to fix every problem everywhere in the world. Uh, but we're very committed to a number of small regions in Kenya and in Tanzania and we won't leave then until uh, everyone in these regions has good access to clean water and good sanitation. And as an example, uh, 8 out of 10 people lack access to clean water and to safe sanitation in Bomit County. So we work with communities and with schools through the following three things. First of all, taps. So we build taps and we provide a clean and reliable water source. And this could be done through rainwater collection or through a borehole system. Secondly, we build toilets. So typically when we go to visit a school, the toilets will be kind of in the land behind the school and it will be a timber shack with holes in it, basically sitting over a hole in the ground. Uh, and these are really don't provide any privacy for the students. Uh, they also spread disease very quickly because they're extremely unhygienic. And thirdly, they're actually prone to collapse uh, and have been horror stories of children being caught inside when these toilets have collapsed. Um, so what we do is we build uh, good, sustainable toilets with proper foundations like the one you can see here um, that will last a much longer period. And the third thing we do is training. So we teach all the staff and all the students how to use these facilities properly, um, how to protect themselves from disease and how to maintain them. Uh, and the second part of training that we implement is menstrual hygiene management training. So we basically teach girls how to manage their periods and we teach them that it's normal because there's a huge taboo, uh, taboo around periods in Kenya still. Um, so hopefully they won't have to miss out on, on school as they do currently or any opportunities in life. And that's basically us. So we call it the three T's, taps, toilets and training. And we believe that these three things together provide a, a sustainable long-term effect for these communities to improve their well-being. Because there would be no point building a, a shiny new toilet block if you didn't teach them um, how to use it properly or if you didn't give them somewhere to wash their hands as well. So that's why these three things work in harmony. But we don't just walk away from our projects. Uh, we are community-led in everything that we do. Uh, and we commit to monitoring every project that we run for at least five years. Uh, and some of the projects for much longer than that, depending on their circumstances. Actually, if you go to our website, you can see every single project that we've run uh, and you can see how well they've been up kept and if we're revisiting any of them. Uh, and the yellow pins there are actually projects that we have in the pipeline. So those are the ones that will be coming up in the next year or so. And if you get involved with Dig Deep this year, uh, that's where the money will be going. A few statistics about our work so far. So we've built taps and toilets that in the next five years alone will provide clean water for over 45, 46,000 people. And we've rolled out training for over 200,000 people. Uh, so we've been going for 11 years now as a charity and we're really proud of these statistics. But over the next two years, so by the end of 2020, we're aiming to double everything that we've done so far. So we're taking on a really big challenge. We're really proud of our work. We think we're really efficient and that's where we need your help. So that's where Kilimanjaro comes into it. So hopefully you've seen some pictures before. It is a magnificent mountain. It's the highest freestanding mountain in the world. It's the highest mountain in all of Africa by quite some way. Um, it's actually located in Tanzania, which is just across the border from Kenya, but still very close to our projects. 
So the departure dates will be some point between the 18th of August and the 6th of September in 2019. So we plan the departure dates so that they don't clash with any uh, exam resets that you may have. But if you have any concerns about these, then please do get in touch and we can talk things over. So the duration of the trip is 18 days in total, and six of those days will be actually trekking on the mountain. So next summer, this could be you with all your new friends, You'll be meeting them at a London airport, ready to fly out to Dar es Salaam, which is the largest city in Tanzania. And when you arrive in Dar es Salaam, you'll be met by a Dig Deep representative and you'll have one night in the city. So you'll have your first experience of what a chaotic East African large city is like. Uh, and then the next morning, you'll be off by private bus to the town of Moshi. And as you arrive in Moshi, you'll get your first proper glimpse of the mountain. And it doesn't matter how many pictures you see beforehand, how much reading and preparation you do, nothing quite prepares you for seeing the mountain in real life for the first time and seeing quite how staggeringly tall it is. Uh, also, when you're in Moshi, you'll meet your guides for the first time, the people who will be taking you up the mountain, and they'll be giving you an in-depth brief about everything you'll need to know about mountain life. And they'll also be making sure that you've got all the right equipment with you so you're fully prepared for the next day's climb. So the next day, you'll be starting your climb from the Machami Gate. Uh, so we'll be climbing the Machami route, which we think is the most beautiful route on the mountain. One of the nicest things about the Machami route is you can actually see the summit of the mountain on every day of the trek. So you can always see exactly where you're heading. Uh, it's also really good as a route for acclimatization and it goes through a, a beautiful array of habitats. Um, so when you get to the gate, you'll officially sign into the national park. There'll be loads of excitement. So you'll meet all your guides and your porters for the first time as well. Uh, and you'll start to feel very, very real. And then you'll be setting off. So the first day is a fairly comfortable five or six hour trek through this really thick, lush, beautiful rainforest. If you've never been through a landscape like this before, it's really quite surreal. Uh, you'll probably see some monkeys swinging through the trees and they might even try and steal your lunch. So watch out. And after five or six hours, you'll arrive at your first camp and be hopefully with a big smile on your face like this, and you'll be preparing for your first night of camping on a volcano. Day two, so you can already see, you're out of the rainforest now, the landscape's changed completely. Uh, and this is one of the great things about Kilimanjaro is that it has four different ecosystems. So every day you'll be walking through a completely different landscape, completely different scenery. Uh, and so there's always photo opportunities throughout the climb. You can see in this video here a little bit what that landscape's like. It's a little bit eerie, so there's no more trees now. You get these kind of alien shrubs uh, and you get much more expansive views over the mountain. And you can see it's only day two, but you're already well above the clouds. So it's absolutely beautiful. Which means, of course, plenty of opportunities for those cover photos, those Instagram photos. And you've got to get that classic like boy band album cover looking away from the camera like this one. And then you finish the day with a hot cup of tea and one of the best sunsets of your life. If you've got some time, you might even have a bit of a kick around with some of the guides and porters who will be very, very good at football. And then day three. Day three is your acclimatization day. So as you probably know, the higher up a mountain you go, the air gets a little bit thinner. So it becomes a bit harder work. Um, you'll see here the pace is much slower. You'll be walking slower. Uh, and once again, the landscape has completely changed. So it's now something called the Alpine Desert, which is a bit like walking on the surface of the moon. So what you'll be doing on day three, you'll be walking up to a place called Lava Tower, which is 4,600 meters. Uh, and here is Lava Tower, hopefully. Yep, and when you get to there, you'll be having a celebratory lunch. You'll be feeling euphoric. And you might even have an improv uh, rap music video like this group with some terrible twerking from Jack. And then in the afternoon, you'll be walking downhill for the rest of the day to a place called Barranco Camp. So Barranco Camp is probably the most beautiful camp on the mountain. You can see here you get a stunning view of the summit. Uh, so this will be your third night on the mountain. And you'll need a really good night's sleep because the next morning on the right hand side there, if I can just draw that, that is... Uh, an area called Barranco Wall, and that's what you'll be climbing first thing in the morning. 
So this is Barranco Wall, which is the steepest part of the climb, and it's normally everybody's favourite part of the climb as well, because it starts to feel like a proper mountain. So you have to scramble a bit, you have to use your hands and your knees, um, but it's not too scary. The guides will be there to help you all the way, um, and you don't need any climbing experience either. There's no ropes required at all. And at one point on Branco Wall, you'll reach a point called the Kissing Rock. Uh, so Killy legend has it that if you kiss the Kissing Rock, you will reach the summit of Kilimanjaro. So this is George from 2018. Uh, he kissed the rock uh, a little bit too passionately for my liking, uh, but he did indeed reach the summit of Kilimanjaro. Uh, I have also kissed the rock and I made it to the top, and so did everyone in the Dig Deep office. So don't risk it and make sure you kiss the kissing rock. And then before you know it, you'll reach the top of Branco Wall on day four, and you'll be rewarded with incredible platform for views. Uh, and this is where everybody gets those classic team jumping photos that they love sending into us. Uh, and you can see just cut off the picture on the right hand side there is Mount Meru in the background. So you get a stunning view of the curvature of the earth will appear through the clouds. It's absolutely beautiful. And then for the rest of the day, you'll be kind of gentle up, uphill a bit, downhill a bit. And finally, you'll make it to your fourth camp and you'll have a big family dinner as always. So the food on the mountain is absolutely amazing. You'll be having it in a, a big mess tent like this every day. Uh, it's fully inclusive of three meals a day uh, and we can cater for all dietary requirements as well. So we always have vegetarians, vegans, gluten intolerances, uh, nut allergies, it's not a problem at all. Just let us know in advance. And on day four, you'll be off to bed nice and early, probably around six o'clock in the evening. And that's because day five is your summit night. So on summit night, you'll be woken up by your guides with a hot cup of tea in your tent, uh, probably around 11.30 p.m. or midnight, uh, and it will be absolutely freezing outside. So even though you're in Africa, even though it's in the middle of summer, uh, when you're at this altitude in the night, it's really, really cold. So you'll really have to wrap up. And you won't want to leave your tent, uh, but when you do leave your tent, and the guides will make sure that you do, you'll be rewarded with stunning views like this one. So all of these photos have been taken by our climbers with Dig Deep, uh, most of them from this year. This is a photo by one of our fundraisers this year as well. And then around 12.30, maybe 1 a.m., you'll be setting off from camp uh, and you'll have a view like this. So summit night is probably going to be one of the hardest nights of your life, but it will definitely, definitely be one of the best nights of your life as well. Uh, you might be wondering why we climbed the summit at night. There's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, in the daytime, uh, because the air is a bit thinner at this altitude, the sun is incredibly strong. So even though it feels quite cold, you can get sunburnt very, very quickly. And the second reason is that the top of the mountain has a surface that we call scree. So it's a bit like gravel. Um, and actually in the daytime when it's warm, uh, the gravel kind of slips away under your feet and it's just a little bit harder work than it would usually be. But at night it freezes over and you get more of a firm footing. So you'll be walking for a few hours with your head torches on and a single file line, gradually making your way up the mountain, maybe with some music on, I don't know. Um, and then at one point everyone will just stop and it'll go quiet. Uh, and you'll all turn around and you'll be hit by the sudden wave of warmth just as the sun comes up over the horizon. Uh, and this picture is absolutely stunning. It's taken by one of our fundraisers this year. But even this picture doesn't quite show what that experience is like when the sun comes up over the top of the clouds like that. It's probably the only time in your life that the sun will rise from below you. So it's absolutely an uh, incredible, surreal experience. The whole mountain will illuminate and you'll suddenly be able to see everything around you. And you'll keep plodding along, making your progress with your whole team. Uh, you can see it'll be getting a bit colder now, further up the mountain, some snow. Uh, and before you know it, you'll be reaching a place called Stellar Point. Go on, Kerry! So Stellar Point is one of the highest parts of the mountain, but it's not the perfect summit <laughs> just yet. You'll probably be feeling a little bit tired at this point, as Kieran is here. <laughs> but the guides will be there to help you up and make sure you're on your way. So the top of Kilimanjaro is a crater rim. So Stellar Point is the first point along the crater rim that you'll be reaching. Um, and you're actually very, very close to the real summit, which I'll just circle there. Behind that sign is the actual summit, which is only 300 metres away. And if you walk into the shops, 300 metres is not very far at all. Um, 
but after five days of trekking at a high altitude, it will be feel like a long, long way. But sure enough, with the support of your team and the guides, not long later, you'll make it to the top of Kilimanjaro. And finally, you'll have reached the summit of all of Africa. You'll have all your friends around you, be miles above the clouds, and it is just a euphoric experience. I really I can't describe what it's like to, to feel like you've reached the top of a mountain. Um, but I think it's something that everyone should do in their life. Uh, and yeah, people will react in different ways. Um, a lot of people will get very emotional. Uh, some people will be singing, dancing. Um, but you might want to think about other things that you could do at the summit. Uh, so this is me a few years ago. Uh, I carried a chair to the top, which I really do not recommend. It was really hard work. Uh, and I also had a celebratory beer at the top, which did not go down very easily either. And then after about half an hour at the top, uh, obviously what goes up must come down uh, and you'll be ready to make your progress back down the mountain. So you'll be heading down really quite quickly down the mountain. You'll be full of adrenaline. You'll be so uh, ecstatic with that feeling of getting to the top. Uh, you won't be tired anymore at all. And of course, with every step, you'll be getting a little bit more oxygen back into your system. So you'll be feeling really, really happy. And you'll make it to your final camp on the mountain. And then you'll wake up on day six, uh, you'll peel back the opening to your tent and you'll see that view way, way in the distance. And, you, and you'll think, surely I wasn't at the top of Kilimanjaro last night. It is such a, a surreal feeling. It will not feel real at all. Um, and at the start of day six, you'll also get together with all the guides and the porters uh, and celebrate reaching the top of Kilimanjaro. And this is the first time you'll realize just how big your crew actually is. So you'll be tracking in a group of probably 30 to 35 fundraisers from your university and other universities around the country. Uh, and for a team that size, you'd expect to have between 70 and possibly as many as 120 uh, crew. So that's not just your guides, but all the porters who'll be carrying stuff up and down the mountain. They'll be overtaking you every day. Uh, you will have your cooks, your assistant cooks, uh, your waiters. So it's a really uh, big operation. And then after a few hours of trekking on day six, back through the rainforest, you'll reach the gate. So this is a different gate to the one you've arrived at. You'll be coming down a different route to the mountain. Um, and this is where we have a big tipping ceremony. So all the people who helped you on your climb will come up one by one and they'll collect a, a little bit of a tip for all their hard work. Uh, you can probably have your first celebratory beer. Uh, you'll be reunited with the Dig Deep staff as well. Um, maybe look in the mirror for the first time in a week. Uh, and it'll be a really nice experience as you have a meal with everyone uh, in your team. So that's basically the climb. Uh, the registration fee to get involved is £295 um, and this part books your flight. So once you've paid this registration fee, uh, we can welcome you into your university team. And this is sadly non-refundable for that reason. The fundraising target after this is £2,990 which will be due a, probably a month before your actual trip departure. So it's very important to point out that this is a 50-50 ratio. So half of this money is a direct donation to Dig Deep and to all their projects, and the other half pays for the trip, basically. So where does that money go? Well, first of all, it covers uh, everything on the mountain regarding food, water, tents, sleeping mats, uh, and all the staff, so the guides and porters and chefs are all covered as part of that cost. Also the entrance to the National Park, which is $850 on its own. So a large portion of that money is going towards that entry cost. Um, travel costs are included in terms of the flights to and from the UK and all the relevant transfers once you're in Tanzania. So obviously the flights are a big expense that we cover as well. You also get uh, one night of accommodation before and after the challenge and support staff whilst you're in the country. Other things that you should be aware of though, uh, visas, depending what country you're from, we'll have to look into that later on. Um, they're not too much money though. Uh, tips for the guides and the porters, any independent travel you might want to do after the climb, which is what I'll talk about next. And obviously you'll need to see a doctor to make sure uh, if you need any medication, uh, make sure you've got travel insurance as well. 
Hi guys, it's Rachel here, just briefly interrupting to tell you all about the wonderful rest and relaxation packages that our suppliers will be organising for you guys. So I'm speaking on their behalf today to tell you about what you could get up to after you've summited Mount Kilimanjaro. So as you can see, you could head off on beautiful safari there, or after that you could then go and relax and put your feet up in Zanzibar, which is a coastal island island off Tanzania. So we work really hard to find really awesome suppliers for you out in Tanzania that take great care of you on the mountain and offer you the most amazing experience. So after you've completed your challenge then these will be the people that will be organising your rest and relaxation trips for you. Now these guys know Tanzania better than anyone so you're in very good hands to have an incredible trip where you can really experience the joy of East Africa. So after your challenge obviously you could head off on safari. Now these are some pictures from our fundraisers last year. The suppliers took them to Tarangiri National Park which is a beautiful national park famous for its elephants. So there's about 3,000 elephants resident population there so hopefully you'll get a chance to see some of them and it's not uncommon to see herds of a couple of hundred as well. And then also you might have the chance to see some big cats like lions here or maybe if you're really lucky cheetahs and leopards and obviously in the evening of your safari you can witness those beautiful red savannah sunsets as well so you can have a really amazing time on safari and after you've taken some beautiful photos then head down to the idyllic paradise island of Zanzibar which is world famous for its beautiful crystal clear waters white beaches and just general chilled out um, relaxing vibes there so you'll stay in a lovely hotel with all of your friends um, and just have a really really wonderful time put your feet up and obviously if you want to go and do some excursions then there'll be options for you to arrange those as well so as for some example prices of these, we don't have the exact costs yet, but the suppliers will get in touch with you when they do. Um, but based on what they offered last year, we can give you a rough price. So Safari and Zanzibar last year cost about £885, dependent on exchange rates. And Moshi and Zanzibar, so that's the slightly cheaper option where you can stay in Moshi, experience kind of local life, go on a few tours around the town and then head to Zanzibar with the rest of your team was £675. Now it's worth mentioning that um, whilst you're in Zanzibar all of your food will be included um, as well as on safari you'll have your food included as well so that really does um, bring you know bring down the cost of the price there. Now normally how it works with these is that you'll pay a registration fee directly to the suppliers around kind of May time next year and then you'll pay your remaining balance when you arrive in Tanzania so that you've got the whole summer to save up for your incredible R&R package. So that's the rest and relaxation for you so now I'll hand it back to Sam to talk all about fundraising. So you might think uh, Sam, this sounds amazing. I would love to climb Kilimanjaro. Um, you know, I'd love to go on safari, meet new people, go to Zanzibar. But how on earth do you raise £2,990? Well, the first thing you should know is that if you haven't fundraised before, you're not alone. The vast majority of people who climb Kilimanjaro with us have never done any fundraising before. So that's where we come into it and we'll help you as much as we can throughout the year. Uh, the second thing is that it's not like having a part-time job. It should be based around your hobbies. It should be based around things that you would do anyway, things that you enjoy doing, and hopefully it'll be really, really fun. Um, so some examples here, you can see the bottom, uh, someone hosted a poker tournament because they were really into their poker and made loads of money from that. Uh, next to him is actually me sat on Donald Trump's shoulders. So I like to do lots of running uh, and I do the Sheffield half marathon every year in fancy dress. So raise some money from that. Uh, but you can be really creative with it and come up with absolutely anything. We've had all sorts of ideas before. Please tell us your crazy ideas. We absolutely love to hear them. Uh, one of my favourite stories is someone who stood outside the students' union with a fish and they just got people to slap him with a wet fish in exchange for a couple of pounds donation. So you really can do absolutely anything and have a load of fun with it. And it sounds like a lot of money, £2,990, but when you break it down month by month or event by event, hopefully it seems a little bit more manageable. 
Uh, so as an example, uh, this is how my colleague Simon fundraised uh, not too long ago. Uh, he did two football tournaments and raised about £500 from each of those, but he got something called match funding, which we can advise you on. Uh, basically where you approach a large company or a bank uh, and they have a certain quota to fill throughout the year in terms of fundraising. So if they get involved with your event, they could actually double everything you make from that event. So he managed to do that twice and that took him over £2,000 already. He also did some group events there, so group speed dating, uh, open mic night, cake sales. So we love it when you get involved with the rest of your team at your university. You can all pull together and do group events, but you do have to be aware that you would have to split the money at the end of it so that they don't raise quite as much. Uh, but it's really good to get the ball rolling. Uh, and sometimes events between two or three people can actually be the most successful ones. And then on the right hand side, I started out by emailing everyone in my extended family, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, just saying, I don't want any Christmas presents this year. Please just donate to this charity I'm working for. Uh, so I got £300 straight off the bat. Uh, my village does a little music festival every year. So I went around on the Friday and the Saturday. I spoke to the landlords of all the pubs and I just asked if I could go around with a collection tin, basically. And I made £900 in one weekend. I'm also mad about pub quizzing. So I host a pub quiz every month. It usually makes about 50 quid. Um, and when I turned it into a charity pub quiz, it started to make more like 100 quid each time. So that was really good. I worked for a bit of mine, nothing wrong with that. If you have a part-time job on the side, sometimes it's easy just to, to have some guaranteed income. Um, loose change, so I approached some local shops and a post office, and I just asked if I could leave a collection tin on their counter uh, for a few months. Uh, and they, most of them said yes. Uh, and I got in touch with Dig Deep and they sent me some more collection tins. So that raised about eight, 180 pounds. So, you are the first drop. Um, remember why you're doing this. You know, it's amazing that you want to get involved and to climb Kilimanjaro, but hopefully also you want to really help uh, impact communities in Southwest Kenya. And your fundraising alone could provide 90 children with access to clean water. So thank you. And finally, why choose a Dig Deep Challenge? Well, first of all, we've all been in your shoes. So everyone in the Dig Deep office started out watching a presentation a lot like this, thinking, how am I going to fundraise that money? Um, and then however many years down the line, we're still involved with Dig Deep because we absolutely love what they do. We know how difficult it can be and how daunting it can be to get involved with fundraising whilst you're at university, uh, but we have loads of experience that we can help you throughout the year. Secondly, we're here for you when you need us. So we have staff full time in the office who are looking after you basically throughout the year. They are always a Facebook message, a text, a phone call away, an Instagram, a tweet, whatever it is. Uh, we love to have a chat with you. So we're here at your disposal all year to help you as much as we possibly can. And if you don't want to take our word for it, then you can talk to all of our previous fundraisers. Just remember you are absolutely not alone in this. Every year we have around 300 people taking part in our challenges uh, and we're expecting the same number this year. So you'll be part of a huge Dig Deep community. Um, you'll also be involved in a Facebook group with all the other climbers around the country and all the past climbers as well. So if you have any idea about a fundraising event but you're not really sure, I guarantee you someone will have thought of it before. Uh, someone might have even done it before uh, and they'll be there to, to give you some advice about how it went or how you could improve it. And it's not just about contributing to charity, but we want to help you as well. So we have great feedback about people uh, gaining valuable experience and skills. You know, from a personal point of view, last year I had to go to loads of job interviews as I was doing my fourth year of architecture. Um, and working with Dig Deep was always the main talking point at those interviews. You know, it's great just that you've got a degree, but they're going to be interviewing other people with the exact same degree. So what have you done that you know really makes you stand out on your CV? Uh, and for me, organising fundraising throughout the year absolutely made me stood out and I got loads of job offers, thankfully. Secondly, we do have opportunities to get more involved with the charity if you want to later on. Uh, we have both paid and unpaid internships and volunteering roles available. And thirdly, we can offer advice, you know, if you really enjoy it and you want to get involved in more third sector work. We work very closely with a lot of other charities. We know lots of other programs, uh, volunteering projects that we can guide you towards. And just a final word on safety and ethics. So we know Kilimanjaro is absolutely beautiful. It's an incredible climb. We would love to have you involved, but we don't take it lightly. It is a serious challenge. It's a serious mountain um, and you shouldn't take it lightly either. Safety is the most important thing on the mountain. Uh, and as an example of how seriously we take this, 
on your summit night, there will actually be as many guides as climbers. So each person would have their own personal guide should they need them. And this is reflected in our success rate on the mountain. So normally on Kilimanjaro, the number of people who reach the top is around 65%. So just under two thirds. Um, when you climb with Dig Deep, our success rate is around 95%. So that is a testament to how seriously we take things like acclimatization on the trek. And this has led to us being uh, working very closely with an organization called the Kilimanjaro Porters Assistance Project. So this might not make much sense until you're actually in Tanzania and you see it firsthand. Um, but there is sadly a history of the porters, the people who work on the mountain, uh, being exploited. So they're not being given a fair wage or they're being asked to carry too much stuff, not being given uh, proper climbing equipment. Um, we want absolutely nothing to do with that as an organisation, which is why we work with KPAP very closely and we've actually been rewarded because um, they've named us as a partner for responsible travel and we're the only UK charity that has that status. So as a result, this is genuinely the most ethical way that you can climb Kilimanjaro. And thirdly, we won't let you down. So we are at all protected. We're a fully registered charity. We're registered with a fundraising regulator. If there's anything else you want to know about the charity, please, please get in touch and let us know. Um, and we'll guide you in the right direction. Jabba make me smile, never let me die. Wipe away all tears from my people lie. Set my soul free, till eternity. Emancipation, Lord God, this man will redeem and seek a seeker, you will find. Headless peace of mind, no need for crime, we bubble up and shall decline. You can never hit me, talk with this vice, man. Jabba will always keep me, love me, revive me. I keep walking, I keep talking, I keep trying, I keep fighting. Keep up my jobs. Trust me, people try resist. Trees who fall and evil cover people try persist. Life is just a game, and you don't know the final twist. Never could have known if you never try risk. Choose negativity and fears the bucket list. Fight for humanity, cause we all need a fix. Feed all the multitude, the aged and the sick. Rise over pestilent, the hustle on the seat. Cause I know my mission, and my mission is to love. Love one another, all my friends and foes. To blood and fire, sticks and stones when I burn our bridges. We know my keep walking. Keep talking, keep trying, keep fighting These vampires, oh Lord, my God I keep walking, keep talking, keep trying, keep fighting These vampires, na 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 So hopefully that gives you a taster as to what the trip's like. Um, that was a video by Emma, one of our fundraisers this year. Um, so this could be you with a whole new team of friends hopefully some lifelong friends as well um, at the roof of Africa next summer. So if you want to get involved, uh, please go over to climbforcleanwater.org and the registrations are now open for 2019 uh, and you can choose your university from a drop down menu. Uh, thanks for listening. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate. Please get in touch and we'll be happy to answer. <laughs>